When I made videos for Clickist, I did a series on a little crowdfunded game called Star Citizen. It raked in tens of thousands of views, and nobody had any problems with it whatsoever. Nope, none at all. So, on the one year anniversary of the third and final part, I think it's time we revisit the game's development and see what's changed. To say the discourse surrounding Star Citizen is divided would be an understatement. On one side, you've got people saying it's the scam of the century, that creator Chris Roberts is a con artist, and that Star Citizen isn't living up to its potential. On the other hand, you've got fans who have no problem spending thousands of dollars on its crowdfunding campaign or its microtransactions. Yes, Star Citizen has, well, macro transactions is a good term for them, going for hundreds or even thousands of US dollars. You may remember hearing last year about the $27,000 DLC. We'll get to that, don't you worry. It's now been exactly one year to the day since the third and final part of my original semi-documentary series, so it's time to go back to the well and see what's been going on behind the scenes. And gotta get them views too, buddy boys. First, a brief recap. Star Citizen is an online space simulator MMO shooter by Chris Roberts, the creator of Wing Commander, and his new company Cloud Imperium Games. He started development back in 2011 and took the project to Kickstarter in 2012. At the same time, he also started raising money independently on his own website, Robert Space Industries, or RSI. Both campaigns were a huge success, the Kickstarter raising over $2.1 million, and the RSI campaign raising over $180 million by the end of 2018 and counting. Since then, it has been a roller coaster ride for everybody involved. Star Citizen became a record holder for the highest grossing crowdfunding campaign ever, it's been delayed countless times, the single player portion called Squadron 42 was spun off to its own game which is now being worked on by a separate studio headed by Chris's brother Aaron, Cloud Imperium Games was accused of not sharing enough information with backers, the game saw the introduction of microtransactions and DLC in excess of $100, and Cloud Imperium and Chris Roberts were sued by Crytek and a backer and were investigated by the American Better Business Bureau. All while this was happening, another former backer by the name of Derek Smart made it his personal mission in life to wage war against Star Citizen and Chris Roberts for what he views as mismanagement and consumer unfriendly business practices. Okay, like I said, that was all a brief summary. You can go watch the first three parts of the series if you want a more detailed look. I just did, and oh boy, was I terrible at making videos back then, my goodness. I want to again stress that this video, just like that original series, is intended as a broad overview of Vince and not a complete comprehensive rundown of everything over the last year, though I will be touching on all the major stuff. Right, with that out of the way, let's get started. We'll begin right where part 3 left off, literally. April 2nd, the day after that video went live, saw the release of Alpha 3.1. The first of their promised quarterly updates, Cloud Imperium finally began sticking to their roadmap. This is the first step in fulfilling the pledge we made to our community last December to target quarterly updates to Star Citizen, said Chris Roberts about the update in an accent he doesn't have. These are important updates and our fans should see some significant improvements to Star Citizen's overall experience. 3.1 centered on performance enhancements, including changes to the game's damage model and physics, and a slightly tweaked user interface to make up for some mapping-related bugs that didn't give you a great idea of spatial awareness. The update also added five new spaceships, which, yes, all had to be purchased separately. But on the back of this update came good news for the team. On April 17th, Roberts' own website announced Star Citizen had over 2 million players. To celebrate, everyone who bought the game would be getting new items for free. These items were badges for the first 1 million and 2 million players, as well as in-game t-shirts. May 2018 saw the darkest turn yet for Star Citizen's crowdfunding campaign. Late that month, a DLC pack went up for sale containing six in-game spaceships and a whole bunch of other in-game models and knickknacks. The price for all of these goodies? $27,000. No, I'm not kidding, and no, you haven't heard wrong, unless you did. $27,000. That's not the end of it either. The only people who were allowed to buy this pack were players who already spent at least $1,000 on the game and its various microtransactions. Before you start thinking it can't get any worse, it does. 
You can't even view the page selling this DLC if you're not one of those $1,000 spenders. I love this line written on Dual Shockers by Lou Cantaldi. However, naysayers forget to keep in mind that people can do what they want with their own money, and the bundle is entirely optional. Mm. There's missing the point, and then there's bending over backwards to defend slimy business practices. This entire fiasco is an insult to you, to me, and above all the people who have already spent so much time and money on Star Citizen and want to see it succeed, and now they're being asked to spend five-digit figures to get the most out of the game they already bought. Trying to leech 27 grand out of your customers while telling them they have to spend that money to make the game as good as it can be is disgusting, and that's what's happening here, not to mention, you know, None of that stuff is worth even half of that number, to say the least. All of this DLC, all of these microtransactions are being counted on Star Citizen's crowdfunding campaign. That means if I spend $28,000 to get access to and then buy this pack, that 28k will be listed on the game's crowdfunding income. That's how Cloud Imperium and Chris Roberts have managed to make hundreds of millions of dollars in crowdfunding, not by saying they needed this income to create their vision of this epic game, but by already making that game and using it to sell virtual tchotchkes, again claiming to their backers and potential backers that really, they need that money to simply make the game that's already being made. In June 2018, Alpha Build 3.2 went live, again following the game's roadmap for a new Alpha Build every quarter. The update added three major gameplay features, one of which being able to mine planetary bodies. Just park your ship with a scanner near an asteroid or planet, and use that to find mineable locations. I don't know if mineable is a word, but it is now. The update also added a group system to find and team up with your friends easier, and quantum linking which lets you fast travel to your friend's destination to hook up with them easier. The bigger piece of news from around this time came in July, when Ken Lord, a data scientist who backed the project with a $4,500 investment between 2012 and 2018, lost a court case against Robert's company RSI. There's a lot to the case, but the cliff notes are this. Lord argued that the game he backed in 2012 wasn't the same game he ended up with in 2018, and asked for a refund. Cloud Imperium and RSI refused, saying that they had a 14-day refund policy and that Lord had gone way past that. Lord argued that the original terms of service from the 2012 Kickstarter didn't mention this and took them to court. According to Motherboard, who wrote an excellent piece detailing the entire process, the proceedings went like this. Lord came to court prepared. He had printed out multiple versions of the Terms of Service, all records of communication with RSI, and a long document recording the 77 promises RSI hasn't fulfilled in a timely fashion, including citations showing where and when RSI made those promises. According to Lord, when RSI's representatives stood before the judge, they tried to argue the arbitration clause of their TOS. Right off the bat, they assert their arbitration clause applied to everything, even though it plainly didn't, Lord said. I had to give the judge a copy of the first terms of service that clearly show that the arbitration clause was not there for the first few transactions. RSI's representatives tried to frame Lord's participation in Star Citizen's beta tester program as evidence it had delivered a game. Lord is part of RSI's evocati, meaning he gets to beta test and do bug reports on early versions of the game. Them portraying bug testing as playing was, I felt, disingenuous at best because they were trying to make a value proposition that they had given me something for my money when, in fact, they had gotten free services, he said. According to Lord, the judge decided to apply the current TOS to all the transactions in the dispute. He said he didn't want two rulings floating out there, Lord said. Lord later went on to say he'd continue pursuing his legal options, but as far as I can tell, this is the last anyone's heard about this case, publicly anyway. This isn't the first time a lawsuit was filed by a backer against a crowdfunded project. A backer sued Seth Quest, creator of the hand-free iPad stand Kickstarter project in 2013 for failing to deliver their product, but later dropped the suit. In 2015, the creator of the Kickstarter campaign for the board game The Doom That Came to Atlantic City was sued by the American Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, and was ordered to pay $112,000. Also in 2015, Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson filed a suit against the creators of the Asylum Trading Card Game, which was kickstarted in 2012. Ferguson and the state of Washington won that case, and the creators of the Asylum were ordered to repay backers $668 each. But what happened with Lord and Star Citizen was unprecedented. It was the first time a Kickstarter backer sued the creator of a campaign and lost. But this victory was short-lived. 
The very next month, on August 14th, 2018, a judge rejected a motion by Cloud Imperium to dismiss a lawsuit brought against them by Crytek. Again, this is a very complicated legal matter, but the gist of it is this. Star Citizen and Squadron 42 began life using Crytek's CryEngine. However, in 2015, Cloud Imperium stopped using this engine and switched over to Amazon's Lumberyard engine, which is itself heavily based on the CryEngine. This switch, by the way, wasn't publicly announced until late 2016. When Crytek got word of this, they sued Cloud Imperium in 2017 for breach of contract, claiming that CIG and RSI had signed a contract to use CryEngine exclusively. This came during a rough time for Crytek, when they were closing a bunch of studios and laying people off left, right, and center. The judge refusing to dismiss the case may have looked positive for Crytek on the surface, but they pretty much lost the suit already at this point. Cloud Imperium originally filed a motion to get the case dropped, claiming that just because they signed a contract to use the CryEngine didn't mean they were legally required to only use it and nothing else. The judge presiding over the case, Dolly Gee, denied Cloud Imperium's motion. However, she also ruled that signing a contract to use an engine does not require the exclusive use of the engine in question, meaning Crytek is not entitled to impunitive damages for Cloud Imperium's switch. The lawsuit would continue, with Crytek still seeking damages from CIG, but the driving force behind the lawsuit would be no more. We'll be picking up that Crytek lawsuit again soon, but August 2018 would prove a busy and disastrous month for Star Citizen. For the last few years, Cloud Imperium has hosted the CitizenCon, a livestream event where they show off the game, talk about what they're working on, chat with fans, that kind of thing. It's always been free in the past, but in August that year, that changed. If you wanted to watch that year's CitizenCon, you would have to fork over $20. Yes, the company that is frequently accused of price gouging fans and backers with overpriced DLC and microtransactions thought it would be a good idea to charge 20 whole dollars to watch a live stream. Chris Roberts defended the move on the forums, limping in with a lengthy post trying to rationalize the move, but here's the highlight. Nothing was ever planned to be paywalled or withheld from the community, and honestly, I like the idea of most people seeing the presentation in their own time as a high quality video, rather than a stream of potentially questionable quality. The live stream aspect was always intended for the most ardent community members that would want to see it live as it unfolds, but can't make it to the event to be there in person. We're not likely to cover the cost of additional coverage and live streaming, but I felt we should be fiscally responsible and try to defray at least some of the additional costs, which is how the current plan came to be. As soon after, Roberts realized that charging your customers $20 to watch a live stream, when you've already charged them hundreds and even thousands of dollars just to play the game, wasn't a great idea, and reversed the decision, making the stream free to watch for everyone. But August 2018 wasn't over yet for Star Citizen, as that same month, Cloud Imperium removed what is arguably one of the game's most important features. Up until that point, there was a 150,000 United Earth credits cap, Star Citizen's premium currency, for all players. But in August, that cap was removed, allowing players to spend unlimited amounts of money on the currency, with the only limitation now being you could only buy 25,000 of these credits per real life day. As you'd expect, this immediately brought about accusations of pay to win. Now, the thing is, these United Earth credits, or UEC, aren't yet usable in the game. You'll be able to use them to buy items later when the game is complete. Players can start buying them now and hoarding them until the game is finished. And yes, this means Star Citizen has essentially a system in place that lets you pre-order microtransactions. How lovely. Anyway, players argued that someone could theoretically buy 25,000 UEC every day until the game releases, letting them essentially inflate the economy, buy all the Grey's ships, gears, and weapons day one, and destroy everything and anyone that gets in their way without anyone to challenge them. This is something that the team did not back down from, however, with Roberts again coming forward to defend the move. In a letter to fans, he said that Star Citizen does not have a specific win state, and that you win by having fun, and fun is different things to different people. The chances of someone buying 25,000 UEC a day until the game comes out are next to none. But they don't need to. They just need to buy enough to purchase a powerful ship, or a planet, or a gun, or anything that can give them a huge advantage over other players early on. Sure, this is an online game and there is no winning, you're only playing to have fun. But I don't know about you, 
My idea of fun does not include playing the finished game on day one, getting rocked up on by a dude with a ship ten times bigger and more powerful than mine, and getting obliterated in seconds without even a hope of defending myself, or someone owning half the galaxy already and not letting me enter. Don't tell me that's fun or fair, because it isn't. This was clearly a naked move to get more money out of players, and nothing else. September and October were relatively quiet for Star Citizen, but October saw the release of a new trailer for Squadron 42. The game has a star-studded cast. Henry Cavill, Gary Oldman, Andy Serkis, Ben Mendelsohn, John Rhys-Davies, Mark Hamill, and Gillian Anderson comprise what might be the most impressive cast in video game history, at least on paper. Normally, a trailer dropping like this wouldn't be all that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. However, when it comes to Star Citizen and Squadron 42, you can bet your galactic ass it does. The trailer alone brought in $1 million in donations to Clan Imperium's campaign, bringing the total donation pool up to $195 million dollars at this point. It was such a success that on November 19th, Star Citizen reached the $200 million funding mark. You've watched us grow from a handful of people to a global staff of over 500, across five studios, four time zones, and three countries, Roberts wrote on his blog. Some of the best talent in the industry is working on Star Citizen and Squadron 42, most of whom are gamers that are inspired by your passion to push the boundaries of what is possible. Star Citizen already broke the record for a most funded crowdfunding project ever in October 2014, when it surpassed $55 million. However, three different cryptocurrencies, blockchain companies, whatever, have all surpassed Star Citizen in the crowdfunding record books, with one of them raising as much as $4 billion. A few days after Star Citizen's $200 million win, Alpha 3.3 launched. Like with the other updates, 3.3 brought a lot of additions and changes, like better performance, better AI, new missions, new locations, new ships, all that stuff. But it didn't bring any major new changes. That would have to wait for the amazingly titled update 3.3.5 a couple of weeks later, which added the game's first explorable planet, Hurston, and the first city, Lorville. To celebrate both Hurston and the $200 million milestone, Star Citizen was free to try and play for eight days starting on November 23rd. These free flyers got to play the entire game, even play with every vehicle and ship in the game. But Cloud Imperium was about to get better news. In a new hearing on December 6th, Judge Dolly Gee ruled in favor of CIG to dismiss the lawsuit brought against them by Crytek. You'll recall that Crytek argued that CIG violated their contract by moving to a different engine. However, Judge Gee ruled that the court determines these allegations are completely conclusory. They merely parrot the language of Section 2.4 itself, referring to the part of Crytek's lawsuit in which they detail how they believe Cloud Imperium violated their agreement, and state, without more factual detail, that defendants have breached the GLA. Such conclusions are not entitled to the assumption of truth at the pleading stage. Basically, the judge was saying that Crytek both wasn't making a strong enough case, and that they were laying accusations against Clan Imperium during a time in which they shouldn't have been. As a result, the case wouldn't be going forward at that time. This did not mean that the lawsuit was over, though. Crytek at this point still has a chance to file an amended lawsuit. The case still isn't technically over yet, but unless Crytek seriously steps up their legal game and present compelling new evidence, it pretty much is. The good news for Star Citizen didn't stop there. A few weeks later, on December 20th, a private investor made a whopping $46 million investment to Cloud Imperium. Because of this investment, CIG is now worth an estimated $496 million dollars. That investor turned out to be billionaire music producer Clive Calder and his son Keith, who in exchange got 10% of the studio stock and now have seats on the board. <clears throat> we were impressed by the vision and passion that Chris and the formidable global team he had assembled have put into building Star Citizen, hmm, Clive Calder said in a press release in what is definitely the way he speaks. And we think that the direct and transparent relationship they have built with their players is a strong foundation for a next generation gaming company. Hmm, see here, hmm, hmm, yes, rich people. Something more interesting to fans is that also because of this investment, Chris Roberts finally announced a rough release date, at least for Squadron 42. They are aiming for a release in the summer of 2020, eight years after the original Kickstarter campaign for Star Citizen. Wrapping up December, and obviously 2018, CIG releases Star Citizen Alpha 3.4 on December 21st. 
This update added whole new areas to the town of Lorville, including a central district, a showcase for ships, and a commodity transfer exchange. Also in this update were six new ships, new armor, new weapons, an expanded mission system, and some other bells and whistles. Overall, 2018 was a pretty eventful year for Clan Imperium, Chris Roberts, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. There were a lot of down moments, mostly from microtransactions and terrible business practices, but some ups too, like a concrete release date schedule and legal victories. One of those legal victories sets a terrible precedent for crowdfunding in the future, but whatever, it was a win for them. Our journey through the Star Citizen timeline doesn't stop there, as we move on to... January 2019. It's a new year, and a new us, and a new lawsuit. Just kidding, it's the same old one. On January 16th, Crytek told the court that they would not be amending their original lawsuit at that time. However, the amendment does state, Plaintiff reserves its right to seek leave to amend its pleading pursuit to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 15A2 at a later stage of the proceedings in this action. Oh, I could read that all day. Basically, they're punting on fixing their suit until a later unknown date. I don't know why, I'm, I'm sure there's some good reason. Or at least their lawyers think so, anyway. January was a quiet month for Star Citizen, so we'll move on to... February 2019. At least we don't have to deal with that lawsuit anymore. Oh, no, wait, yes we do. On February 6, 2019, Clan Imperium responded to Crytek's response to the court. If you think, with the case nearing its end, that CIG and Chris Roberts would just sit back and let this go away on its own, you'd be wrong. Instead, the two defendants issued an 18-page response, listing old and new points in their defense. I'm no legal expert, surprise, but I think one of the more damning claims by CIG is in Section 24, under Facts Giving Rise to This Action, which states, Defendants admit that, on a February 5th, 2016 phone call, Crytex counsel expressed to Cloud Imperium Games co-founder Ortwin Freyamirth Crytek's concern about defendants distributing Squadron 42 as a standalone game. Defendants aver that, on this phone call, Mr. Freyamirth clarified defendants' plans with respect to Squadron 42, which Crytex counsel agreed would not violate the GLA. CIG's main point seems to be that Squadron 42 isn't necessarily a separate video game from Star Citizen, but are functionally connected together. Again, I'm not an expert on this kind of thing, but if Clan Imperium could prove this phone call took place, and that Crytek's counsel said their plans of releasing Squadron 42 separately would not be a violation of their contract, then I feel like this case would pretty much be over and done with, or at least the vast majority of it. Part of the suit was that Crytek was arguing that Squadron 42 and Star Citizen were two separate games, and thus should be paid twice. But if the court agrees that it's one big game, just kind of, I don't know, different tentacles of the same body or whatever, then that'll be a big hole in their suit. There are still some other issues, like matters of royalties and damage Crytek is after. Crytek alleges Clad Imperium used CryEngine-related material to advertise the original Kickstarter campaign and are owed payment for that, for example. But the meat of their argument would be cut out from under them with this. Much like January, February was a pretty quiet month overall, so we'll jump to the final month in this overly long video. July 20... Uh, no, no, sorry, March. March 2019. Again, it was a pretty slow month overall, save for one big thing. Alpha Update 3.5. Much like the other updates, this one only adds incremental changes with one major addition. In this case, that'd be Area 18, a major city on the planet Ark Corp. It's a full-blown cyberpunk city, complete with its own holidays. There's also a new quest giver in the form of NPC Tisia Pachiko? Tekia? A face customization system, always important in first-person games, and finally the ability to play as a woman. As always, there are a few other tweaks and stuff, but those are the big points. As of today, Star Citizen has raised over $220.5 million from 2.3 million backers. It's only 4 or 8 or 12 players. Um, it's actually still very exciting, and there is a lot of combat going on. Oh... Finally, that's done. Oh, I thought I was going to be here all day doing this. Oh, just imagine how long the research took me. <laughs> it's time to talk about the overall progress of Star Citizen over the last year. Frankly, my opinion hasn't changed much. I'm still on the slightly negative side, I guess, if you want to call it that. 
Star Citizen isn't a scam, to say otherwise would be absurd. You could make the argument that they are intentionally not finishing the game to get more donations, but that would still be wild speculation and nothing more without proof otherwise. Still, it's hard to look at Chris Roberts's and Clan Imperium's behavior throughout Star Citizen's development, especially the last year, and not be at least a little disgusted. The way they led their fans on, still asking for more money, more donations, more microtransactions is just gross. Charging, or at least planning on charging a $20 fee to watch a live stream, having $27,000 DLC that you first have to pay $1,000 just to have the privilege of being offered, the hundreds of dollars for just regular ships, all while getting a massive $46 million investment. I don't see how anyone can see that as anything other than disgusting. If you're one of those people who screams whenever EA or Activision or Ubisoft or whoever else puts loot boxes in their games, then you also better have a pretty big problem with this, because this, this is way worse. I'm sure Star Citizen is a great game, based on how many people like it and how much money it's still raking in. I'm also sure it'll remain great throughout development, only get better even. If you like the game and don't mind paying these exorbitant prices, then that's fine. Good for you, I'm glad you found something you like. Some of the more irrational hate towards Star Citizen, like those calling it a scam or a fraud, that's just silly. There's one and or two games that you can play right now in Star Citizen and Squadron 42, with updates for the latter coming out four times a year, and the former finally getting a firm release date in summer 2020. There is something here, it's not a scam, it's not, I don't know, some take the money and run scheme that we've seen so often from Kickstarter. And, and you know, I even understand CIG not giving that backer their $4,500 refund, despite how much cash they're raking in. Doing so would open the door for every backer asking for all of their money back, and, and besides, that backer was still donating to the game for years and years after the fact. Why the sudden change of heart? I hate the precedent their failed lawsuit sets for the relationship between backers and crowdfunding campaigns, but that's not Clan Imperium's or Chris Roberts' fault. But it's clear something isn't quite right with Star Citizen. Frankly, I think the team just bit off way more than they can chew and now just have to nickel and dime all their backers just to pay for it all. But what are we supposed to do when said team continues charging their fans such extreme amounts of money for every bite before they've even finished chewing? What do you do when those fans are more than happy to not only pay those prices, but attack anyone and everyone who raises their concerns? What do you do when another group has decided that Chris Roberts and everything he stands for is now public enemy number one, and equally attack anyone who even vaguely defends the game? I, I, I don't know. This whole situation is just ridiculous, frankly. Like I said at the end of my part three video, I wish I could wrap this up all nice and neat with a little bow, but what is there to even say about any of this anymore? Where do we go from here? Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video and I didn't piss everyone off. I tried to keep an open mind and to not miss anything important, but if you think I failed at either of those, feel free to tell me in the comments below. Or yell at me, whichever.